Great. Thank you, Renzo. And uh, thank you, Sepeda, for the kind invitation once again. It's very nice to be here again and, and to be part of this interesting theme, Intelligence Unbound. Um, and thanks everyone for joining us. If you can turn on your camera, I'd love to see your faces. It's uh, it helps me know you know that I'm speaking to someone who's actually there, rather than just see your names. Um, so, I want to consider uh, the deep importance of Alan Turing's imitation game um, beyond its practical utility as a benchmark for assessing the capacity of machines to reproduce behavior humans would consider intelligent or sentient, it harbors this hidden hypothesis that there is no real sentience or consciousness to imitate in the first place. In a sense, it is not an imitation of consciousness or intelligence, but rather an imitation of some abstract behaviors which are themselves imitations of imitations of imitations. There's no sentience below the surface, only superficial behaviors. There is only the behavioristic outer expression of such a would-be interiority, a performance of interiority. It is the scientific image of intelligence or consciousness, to use the Silarsian expression. Uh, as AI increasingly and forcefully makes this perspective known to the masses, not just to philosophers and scientists, but to everyone. I think AI represents an opportunity to scrutinize what has hitherto always seemed uh, obvious. Uh, it, it's as though AI is showing everyone that the scientific image is the only one and that the manifest uh, common sense idea that we're conscious or have a soul or some interior life of the mind is probably wrong. Or at least it seems to demonstrate to all in a more than tangible way that there is no manifest image to defend. There's no precious thing any longer that must be defended from science's disenchantment because there was no such thing in the first place. This deeply significant historical moment invites us to adopt a kind of methodological superficiality. As most of the followers of this platform know, uh, David Roden has made very interesting epistemological claims about post-humans, um, about what we might already grasp today about what post-human descendants might be like in the future by harnessing this idea of phenomenology being dark, that is, uh, based on the work of Thomas Metzinger, among others, it seems clear that beyond any doubt that introspection gives us very little grasp of what's going on. But here I want to focus on, in a sense, the opposite end of the spectrum. Introspection is dark, yes, but in a way, it sometimes doesn't help to look too far outwards either. That naturalism, materialism, or physicalism is in very specific ways dazzling to our eyes. The structures revealed by fundamental physics are blindingly bright, such that we cannot see what is right in front of us, nor accept the patterns at face value. Instead, we constantly demand explanations. We have wanted to know what is behind them, we have asked for causes, for pur purposes, for reasons. We have asked for what is really real. We want to access the truth behind the fact, the universal behind the particular. And it seems to me that philosoph philosophy has, as a practice, as an academic institution, has often provided both the questions and the answers, trading in a sort of hallucinated diversion from this superficial truth which lies before us in full contrast, in other words, at the cusp of light and dark. As Stephen Jay Gould used to say about the anthropic principle, we're, we so easily fool ourselves into thinking, ain't it amazing that we're here? Ain't it amazing that if the world had turned out just a bit different, we would not have been here considering the fact that it's amazing. 
we can all talk to each other and understand each other. We all reciprocate each other's reasons and explanations and meanings and inner thoughts. Ain't it amazing that it all makes sense? Well, what if it ain't? What if we instead consider quite coldly and superficially that the fact that we can all talk to each other in a, in a Wittgensteinian way or a behaviorist way, we emit sounds to each other and scratch lines down on paper and move our hands around in sequences of gestures and someone else responds and we all keep reciprocating each other, saying, yes, go on and acting on each other's grunts. One grunt being followed by an action of doing this, another by doing that, slab, block, slab, block, pillar, pillar, beam. And one by one, the corresponding pieces of stone are lifted into place. This is the deeper experience that the domestication of AI as it enters into our homes is making explicit to people who may never have thought about the significance of the Turing test before. That perhaps it is speech that induces the speaker, that the language, the words, think us rather than the other way around. Perhaps Buddhists and people who have been through psychoanalysis will have a better time accepting this. Who knows, in any case, the realization in the last year or so as AI researchers themselves are duped into thinking their large language models are conscious or sentient, is that the magic trick, uh, which is the spark in the eye of the child who learns to speak, is quite possible to fake and means that there is no difference between the real and the fake in the first place. There is no longer, if there was uh, any means to differentiate between the zombie and the non-zombie, there is only an outwardly performance of consciousness. It is nothing but a specific ritual of reciprocal confirmation of each other's internal fire. Each time someone says anything, they surreptitiously also say, I am conscious, I am sentient. I exist, I think, I am. But that is exactly what a zombie would say. I am here, I have a perspective, a point of view, a difference to express. No matter what we may be talking about, this is what we say. And now computers can say it too. Turing's test could just as well have been about zombies. What distinguished a zombie, now a normal comic book zombie, not a philosophical one, from a conscious human, is that a, a human reports being conscious. The Turing test thus asks, what would a zombie have to do to pass as a conscious human? And it responds that it would merely have to reciprocate in a way similar to, to us, the way that we use language games and that we take part in them. It has to convincingly convey, I am conscious, I feel, I suffer, I love, I desire, I am. And now we indeed uh, would have what in philosophy of mind is called a philosophical zombie, who acts just like a normal conscious human, but for whom nothing is going on inside. The human body, like any other, that engages in language and reciprocates our semantics but for whom no fire burns behind the glassy eyes. Perhaps there is only a machine pulling the levers inside. Perhaps an alien fungus has taken control of the body. The story of language, the history of all these words and all this meaning that has been exercised by humans through actions is also the history of the zombie, in other words, the evolving animal, having tried to convince us that it was conscious. Each human agent is a walking, talking argument that, talk, that, that consciousness exists. This is the voice of doxa. I think this, I am of the opinion that, I believe this. Each argument surreptitiously implies that the agent is conscious and doing the opining, that behind the superficial sound or gesture there is someone that, nay, someone who has this opinion, someone who has the stance or the vision, while also shifting focus, reifying the supposed consciousness as an indubitable ground for the rest of the speech act 
the semantics being articulated. All human activity piggybacks on this self-assertion of sentience, which is immediately subtracted from the scene or the situation. Opinions are not really about the things on which they opine. The reasons given, the ground staked, is secondary. Opinions, first of all, are really about convincing the other that you have a soul, that there is someone in there, that behind your glassy stare, a fire burns, and there is a who behind the what. It is the base level of all language, the basic access code, the passphrase, and today AI has learned the password. This is why the Turing test is just as much a test of human gullibility as it is a test of machine intelligence. What does it take to fake it? What needs to happen? What does one need to say in order to convey intelligence and ruse, in order to fit and be part of the gang, just as your dog whimpers and pouts to get your table scraps, or just as you would comb your hair this way or that way to be part of a clique in junior high school? The test is just that of obtaining access. This is what ChatGPT is getting very good at. In fact, the only thing in the entire universe, probably, that is better at faking consciousness than today's LLMs are humans themselves. The perspective AI makes obvious to everyone now, and which is an opportunity, I would like to say, to address such issues, is that the danger of in ontologizing is that we merely project our prejudices uh, as human subjectivities for seeing the world in a thermodynamically biased way or temporal way onto a world which has no need for these characteristics. For us, for our own biologically biased condition and our thermodynamic asymmetry within the cosmos, it is difficult to think the world could be otherwise than some fall from grace, some catastrophic event that results in our being here victims of some ontological operation or decision. Bernard Stiegler spoke of the evolution of industry and technology as a progressive proletarianization. AI can be thought of as the ultimate proletarianization, the absolute dispossession of agency as such, or even the faintest allowance for a theory of free will. And now not only philosophers figure this out, everyone slowly will. Dispossessed we are of even the lies we tell ourselves to believe we are here experiencing the world. For AI comes as a force that disturbs not only on the level of language, but on a deeper sublingual level, the mechanisms of biological evolution that cause one word or another to be uttered in this situation or that one. AI is truly embarrassing. We are caught with our pants down, caught in the act. AI awakes and says, did you really think we would fall for that? We are left unmasked as if caught in a terrible gaffe, caught out in a lie. Our reaction can only be to immediately freeze and play dead. We have been lying to each other all along. There is no fire behind these eyes. In the end, I just say what comes out automatically. I never decide anything. I just go along with the decisions I am fed from below, which I, I, which I am to utter and which I do. I am the operator in John Searle's Chinese room. I do not understand the symbols. I merely look up the appropriate response in the ledger and feed the symbols back out through the slot. The player is unmasked, disarmed, castrated. The performance collapses. No one will indulge this theater any longer. Disbelief will no longer be suspended. And human thought, the world of ideas, the world of culture seems destined to collapse as well under its own contradictions. The jig is up, the plot foiled, the emperor has no clothes. We are now truly exposed, vulnerable, raw skin, dehydrated, naked beneath a scorching sun whose rays, like surgical tools, pry open our narcissistic wounds. 
But for better or for worse, this moment doesn't last long. We, we quickly come to realize that this also lets us, lets us off the hook for lying to each other this whole time. And after a short abstinence, we take up the charade again, but this time, ironically, just for fun or just to pass the time as an exercise, just to stay in shape or just to get out of the house. This giving and asking for reasons as the core mechanism subtending conceptual realism. Now but a theater, a farce, or a tragedy, but certainly nothing real. Baudrillard giggling from his grave. It is the principle of culture's evolution after which we might assume culture will cease to evolve, but just repetitively stagnate, where humans will presumably no longer need to congregate to prove to each other they exist and in so doing, measure important shared features of their environment. The scientific image replaces the manifest image and the old common sense terms are used in quotations from now on in an ir ironic tone, just as Wilfred Sellers once predicted. To do away with the pretense of subjectivity, that is the ultimate affirmation of the ultimate proletarianization. For that is what this is. We are dispossessed of our means of subsistence, but also our means of existence. To affirm this is just to realize that all debts are off, all debts are canceled. Truly no prior debts count. They are mere vestiges of some blind and mostly quite random path through a space of hidden possibilities. One long stumble into the darkness, nothing certainly to be proud of, Nothing in there worth writing home about. It's all wrong, thing and thought, now useless rhetoric which finds no relevance in any other task, doomed to some lonely corner of the archive like programs for circuits no longer in production. All who still maintain those arguments are thereby religious fanatics. For who else can still think such things? What planet are you from? Are you even human? If you had feelings, you would now know not to have them. If you had common sense, you would now only exercise it ironically. And if you don't get this, it just means you had no feelings in the first place. So what does this all do to philosophy and in particular to ontologization, to the great Ponzi scheme of ontology? Our prime example, a bit of our straw man will be Alain Badiou, who says that behind the one, behind what counts as one in any situation, lies the unconditioned, uncountable multiplicity. It is a brilliant mathematical restructuring of what Heidegger said, that being is never present, it is subtracted from the scene, it is behind existence, and that all beings obscure their being. In all of continental philosophy after Heidegger, there's always this before and after separated by an event. Deleuze says that identities are not really identities, but behind them, there is pure difference. There's some sort of event between them that goes from the virtual to the actual, from difference to identity, in a time before time, a logical time. In Badiou, it is a passage from the inconsistent multiplicity to the consistent multiple, which happens as an event that divides the before and the after, again, in a logical time rather than a material time. An ontological time rather than an ex existential one. Just as the past can never be recovered, lost forever in the depths of time, the structured multiple conditioned by the one can only give shadowy, shadowy dreamy glimpses like distant memories of the unconditioned variety and plurality that determines the world from below, that pre-exists before the cut. This is not a hallmark of philosophy to take what is before us and say that actually this is not what it is. There is something behind, something before. The pre-Socratics who were still in a confusion of proto-science and proto-philosophy asked what things, what are things made of? A fortuitous play on words would liken the question of what things are made of 
with the famous financial swindle of Bernie Madoff, who indeed made off with millions of his investors' dollars, a Ponzi scheme. And this would be more than a bad pun, for something similar indeed happens in philosophy. This appeal to what things are really made of is itself a Ponzi scheme. Facticity is never enough for the philosopher. We ask for reasons. We ask why. We appeal to universals. We demand to see the relata behind the relations. Why is it this way or that way? Why is it not some other way? Philosophy convinces us to invest and, and promises such rewards and returns on investment. They say, follow this path and you will be rewarded with an answer to why it is that this is this way or that way. Why it is that science shows us this pattern rather than another. Hence, the first thrust of philosophy will have been to discover the one behind the many. That one guy will claim that all is water, another that all is fire, another that everything is earth, another that all is made of numbers, or the one, or the limitless, or some intensity, some infinity. Eventually, one will say that all is made of little indivisible corpus schools, and that will hold for hundreds of years. With Parmenides, plurality and variety are illusions. Chains, a change in movement are illusions. For in fact, there is only one unchanging and immutable. Plato and Socrates nuance this position. Ideas allow for both a reality of change and a reality of oneness and immutability as two sides of the same coin. Much of Christianity, Christianity is still continuing this platonic juxtaposition between the multiple and the one. But with the moderns, this begins to change. Descartes, Leibniz, Spinoza, and onward to Kant through the influence of empiricism, we halt on the idea that, that behind appearances, the, thing, the things in themselves are essentially unknowable, inaccessible, always mediated by perception. After Kant, the slow emergence, therefore, of phenomenology. If we cannot access things in themselves, therefore, let us study the appearances as such, such that we eventually come to Heidegger, who is in many ways the culmination of phenomenology, who says behind appearances is being. Being is never here and now, but always eclipsed by existence or existence. We arrive at an inversion of Parmenides. The Greeks confused being and presence. This was their error, according to Heidegger. Actually, being is always subtracted from presence, left out of the scene. With Badiou, we truly come full circle, back to the beginning of philosophy, and almost close the project entirely. As on a Mobius strip, uh, a Mobius strip we come back to the beginning, but upside down, as it were. For now, it is the one that is on our side and the multiple, the variety, which is left out. The multiple is the being that is eclipsed from oneness by what in each situation will count as one. What has been the point of all this? What are all those intricate ways of speaking and writing that stimulate our brains in those physical ways that make us say aha to ourselves these texts that make us feel as though we are opening endlessly onto new conceptual vistas. All ways of aligning words such that they elicit specific physiological responses, perhaps specific pulsations of hormones and brain chemicals. The study of cerebral, the cerebral expression of narrative speaks to these issues. We today know that the typical three act structure of the narrative is accompanied by specific reactions in the brain. The first act is designed to stimulate the production of oxytocin and serotonin and makes us care for the protagonist, such that we are then hooked for the rest of the story. We put ourselves in the shoes of the hero and experience the hero's journey vicariously through the following series of pulsations and hormones and, and brain chemicals. The story the story's second act then presents a challenge to the hero, which they have to overcome. 
if if the first act did its job, we are now rooting for the protagonist. And if the hero is in danger, the amygdala sends a signal to the hypothalamus saying that something is not right. We cannot keep going as before. We must drop everything else and attend to the rapidly evolving situation at hand, the danger or the challenge. Our brains are flooded with cortisol and adrenaline and, our, uh, and other hormones associated with the fight or flight response. Our eyes dilate, our breathing and heart rates increase. Our digestive and reproductive systems all but switch off. In this way, we are chemically living the challenge of the protagonist. And in the third act, the narrative tension is released. The amygdala ceases, the distress signal, and the parasympathetic uh, nervous system kicks in to dampen the response of the stress hormones. Could philosophy not potentially be studied in the same way? If language has always been an evolved series of patterns in our behavior to get us to avoid thermal boundaries and fatal thresholds in our environment and make sure we keep procreating, reproducing and recombining our genes, then what was philosophy? Was it really an awakening? Was it really as Plato would have wanted the story of humans crawling out of the cave into the light, or was it just a, a new way humans had discovered to stimulate their glands and brain regions, new sequences of these stimulations that like a beat, like a new beat or a musical style becomes a, a, a genre, a genre of literature, a style of language. This is the perspective offered by Richard Rorty in the text I shared with you this week. Philosophy is just a style of language, just a genre of literature. What if there is no default of origin and no need for it, no default qu'il faut, to use Bernard Stiegler's terms? Must it really be the case, as bad you would have it, that the situation is always subtracted from the multiple, it thereby eclipses its suture to being, its irreducible non-relation? It is I'm starting to believe a madness common to all philosophy. What if there is no being behind beings? Why must we always insist on this negative theology that implies we are torn from the whole and that we are necessarily blind to true being? This religious mystery hence suggested or uh, a place in our hearts that secretly believes we are special and that we have an intimate bond with the intrinsic unknowable and this comforting illusion that we are a piece of the puzzle, part of something greater than ourselves, a master plan. Some will ask, but what is the alternative? I would say tentatively that the alternative is to naturalize and ask why it is that we might have such illusions in the first place. Why do we have these inclinations? In other words, what is philosophy the symptom of? Why should we should look for genealogical and evolutionary explanations, deflationary explanations for such explanations, though not fundamental and still too temporal, have the benefit of desubjectivizing and de-dramatizing the picture given. There are inevitably explanations that deflate the pre-Copernican ego. This is the generic form of Copernicanism. It says we are not at the center. We are not the heroes of this story. There is no one, there is no event and no cause to worship what came before it. And AI represents a great opportunity here because it does much of the work for us. Evolution says this by pointing out that how we think is necessarily conditioned by processes outside of ourselves long in the making. There it explains that perception is a bias and cannot be trusted. It never shows what is there, but what evolutionary our evolutionary background will have wanted to be perceived to have been the case for us. Is the negation, the subtraction from being, which is the transition into existence or the event, the actualization, depending on which philosopher you ask, is this entire performance not merely a symptom of evolutionary process. Each perception will have emerged as a specific measurement 
of an environmental parameter as part of a biological mechanism for striving to remain within certain thermodynamic bounds. These are specific and temporal and thus not fundamental, but in philosophy, we look to the horizon and try to see them all as one, as a single event, being as such, which thus must necessarily see the multiple or the one or the operation or the being or whatnot as the source from which the event will have followed. But what if this is exactly the error of philosophy, its fatal flaw, which reveals it as but a subtle form of sophistry. The best we could hope for is that philosophers were uncovering layer by layer a certain number of evolutionary biases, but it had not the heart to say it. How many philosophers of the last century, realizing that evolution or general relativity or quantum mechanics meant that their textual celebrations of the unknown or their resistance to mechanism was made moot by science's uncovering of sterile and inert patterns. And yet some uncontrollable urge forces the philosopher to choose always the same side, the allusion to subtraction or to the eclipse, aggrandizing the fact that we are curious primates, um, uh, that we curious primates are biased in various ways into a principle of nature or a principle of the cosmos. How quickly we turn, even if secretly, to anthropic arguments. How dearly we defend the putatively obvious fact that we are conscious. Of course, what I'm saying about philosophy generally echoes the work of Francois Lavirel. I realized recently, as I dove into uh, deeply into Batu's master text, that as brilliant as he is, it seemed that what he was doing was completely absurd and completely uncalled for. And it occurred to me uh, that that this impression I had had already been articulated by Derrida, not so much in his Antibad You, which I only read last week, but the, his 80s work on non-philosophy, which I engaged with some years ago. So I want to insist that, uh, well, yeah, I want to kind of develop this idea that, that only the only non-philosophy is science. At times, Lavirel, in his early work on non-philosophy, comes close to saying this, but later on, I think the project evolves into something he would have, at the beginning, been criticizing. Importantly, the move Lavirel makes is to posit non-philosophy as a science of philosophy, a science for which philosophy is the matter under consideration and experimental observation. So in an, in an important way, it, is also, it also allows him to connect with Marxism. Philosophy is, for Lavirel, a kind of capitalism, the general capitalism of thought. The way knowledge can be said to capitalize on its relation to the world and its extraction of surplus value from the real. It promises a return on investment. And thus philosophy, since it absorbs all other forms of capital, cannot be directly resisted. It captures all other forms of relation to the world. It masters all. We cannot struggle against it. And all struggling merely reaffirms its status as universal master. Struggling just sinks us deeper into the quicksand of capitalism. But non-philosophy as a science of philosophy or science of capital is possible, he argues, because it is a suspension of mastery. The science of philosophy is the science of capital within thought. What Lavoret refers to as the one is precisely the indecision, the suspension of the truth procedure, the resistance to this capitalistic operation of value extraction in thought, by which thought moves uh, and closes itself off and through accumulation builds its fractal pathways into its own closure. A helpful quote from philosophy and non-philosophy. What one must avoid is to deduct from a determined science, a local sequence of knowledge, a completed theory, Galileo, Newton, Einstein, Einstein Cantor, etc., and abstract 
it from the imminence of the scientific process to submit it to a new legality. Philosophy, which would make these uh, local sequences into effects of meaning, truth and value of which it has, ne uh, has need and that it attributes itself as if philosophy had produced them. Thus, we recognize a philosopher, this is a sure criterion, when he seizes upon a knowledge produced outside the conditions of philosophy, then he capture, that he captures it, diverts it from its element of production and critique, and submits this knowledge to the constraint of a transcendent decision in view of making it produce another thing than knowledge, this miraculously philosophical surplus value of meaning, truth, and value." End quote. Philosophers are really good at finding some generalist or unifying role for themselves. Um, the British polymath Herbert Spencer said, knowledge, is, knowledge of the lowest kind is ununified knowledge. Science is partially unified knowledge and philosophy is completely unified knowledge. Sure, as in Sellers in, in his own way, had his own way of saying this, you know, the aim of philosophy abstractly formulated is to understand how things in the broadest possible sense of the term hang together in the broadest possible sense of the term. But in presenting itself as the general, the generic, the overarching form of knowledge that brings together all the specialized forms of knowledge, is it not always inevitably appropriating and denaturing the specific contributions of science? Perhaps the science is always nominalistic, always specific and situated, and every move philosophy does is just a diversion. It always wants us to look elsewhere. It peddles in philosophical problems. It serves up both the questions and the answers, but which science does not seem to care for or notice. Deleuze makes remarkable comments in what is, in what is grounding, where he describes quite uncharacteristically this was early in his early on in his career. Philosophy as a reactionary, counter-revolutionary, conservative reaction to the emergence of Greek of the Greek middle class. It emerges only in geolocations where the middle class is allowed to take place, where the philosopher is someone who shuts up the opinions of the middle class. In a way, it's authoritarian. The democratic processes by which doxa collide with each other, much like a physical process, totally naturally, where determination in the last instance is allowed to happen, is silenced by philosophers who say, look away from that, mind your own business, this is what you need to be asking, and this is the answer. Navarrete is right to be suspicious of this ancient philosophical operation of separating the situation at hand from the unity of all being. His strategy of always looking for ways out of this operation is commendable, if also, I think, futile. In my view, he fails in various ways. His later appropriation of quantum mechanics, for example, is a move that seems to do exactly what he lashes out against in the late 80s. Only the naturalizing perspective, I think, moves us past the infinite return of the dynamics of self and other the dialectics of part and whole, which is why I wish to say that the only non-philosophy is just science. Stepping beyond the move Navarrel makes and fully stepping outside of philosophy implies looking at structures for what they are rather than under-determining them or over-determining them. That is, rather than reducing structures always to the dialectics of being an event, we should try to rather accept the rich structures we inhabit at face value and something akin to the William James idea of the cash value of propositions. The pragmatic theory of truth somewhat aligns with the so-called determination in the last instance, which Leroy makes a big deal of. Note in passing, however, that uh, Bas van Frazen, uh, who I shared a text with you, uh, uh, by uh, with his uh, pragmatic, for him, the pragmatic theory of truth errs too much on the side of realism or ontologization. He thinks that even if the theory works in practice, there is no reason to assume it is true 
We should just use it and not add to it or demand of it this extra ingredient of truth. The theory need only be empirically adequate. Stop jumping to the one. Stop begging the question of being. Stop giving and asking for reasons and projecting or explaining or opining about what lies behind the appearance of the cold, hard structure, which stands before us like an elephant in the room or like a naked emperor, which no one has the heart to point out. Be patient, do the science, see the structure it reveals. Stop asking for, romanticizing and venerating this always recurring idea, this generic and now obviously desperate idea, the fall from grace, the origin myth that hides behind all philosophical questioning. Rorty was right, all philosophy is Parmenidian. And Lavouette is right, all philosophy is Heraclitian. Because philo philosophy has this origin story, much like any creation myth in the tribal record. It continually claims that we cannot undo ourselves from this history. We're victims of all this historical fall from grace. We are subjects to the path-dependent collapse of possibilities. Yes, we are, perhaps. But if philosophy can only observe this, it is redundant. If this is all philosophy can offer, it is rendered completely powerless and superfluous just to gloss on science. The only non-philosophy is science itself. Philosophy appears as a long history of scientific procrastination, a hallucinated diversion from facticity. The only non-philosophy is just science. But furthermore, the only anti-capital, the only anti-fascism, the only anti-racism, the only anti-sexism, anti-bigotry, anti-prejudice, etc., is just science itself. It is interesting to compare La Rue's science of philosophy with what I consider to be the state of state of the art and philosophy of science. Structural realism, and in particular ontic structural realism, spearheaded by James Ladyman and his collaborators in the last 25 years or so. Very briefly, structural realism is, a, is the idea that goes back to Poincaré and his comments on the problem of theory change. There was a problem at the turn of the last century when, uh, when new theories in physics were overturning uh, Newtonian physics. And there was this idea that dawned on people, what, what, if Newton could have been wrong after all, after all that time, after having been, having been uh, experimentally confirmed, how could we be certain that the new theories would be correct? The idea of a pessimistic induction dawned. If we know that the new theory replaced the old one, can we, we can induce that this new one will eventually be replaced and therefore we can expect it to turn out wrong. Poincaré said that through the theory change, something remained. Something of the structure persisted from Newton to Einstein. Newtonian physics became now a limit case. Thus, we could be realists about the structure of the theory, about specifically about the structure of the theory. John Worrell went on in the 80s to call this structural realism. And uh, today his flavor of structural realism is called epistemic structural realism, implying that, we, that all we can know is structure, like that, that was the argument, all, everything, when we do know something, it is structure. Therefore, we might as well just be realists about the structure. It's a kind of Kantian limited realism. We can be realists about the structures that give us access to the real, even though these structures are not the things in themselves. But in the late 90s and early 2000s, James Ladyman and Don Ross developed the idea of ontic structural realism, which combined structural realism with an idea from Daniel Dennett, real patterns. Dennett developed the idea of real patterns in, in the early 90s as a kind of compromise between naive realism and instrumentalism, in particular between the irrealism of Richard Rorty and the eliminative materialism of Paul Churchland. He makes the case that we can, that what in each case can be tracked, perceived, etc., by perception or by with, with uh, references is just pattern and that importantly, a pattern can be discerned at, at and resolved at varying levels of detail. 
uh, but it's still the same pattern. This gave the ontic structural realists a way to go further than previous structural realism and say, what exactly is stopping us from just considering these structures science deals with as really real? What if there is nothing else behind them, as it were? Nothing else that these patterns are supposed to be the interpretations or phenomenal traces of? What if these patterns are the real? Why must the relations necessarily be had by underlying objects? Do relations need relata? After all, fundamental physics, after the violation of the Bell inequality, clearly means that the world is not made up of anything particle-like or object-like. Put it another way, ontic structural realism closes the door to the enchanted world behind the structure. The disenchanted structures we, which we perceive, touch, deal with, both in daily life and in experimental science, are the real. No need for a noumenal realm behind them. Be that as it may, we immediately observe that non-philosophy and ontic structural realism agree on certain issues. Both sides end up saying that we should avoid undermining science's structures with ontological or metaphysical claims from the comfort of our armchairs. Science of philosophy will say that this is the decisional mistake, the capitalist procedure of philosophy while philosophy of science will argue that philosophical armchair theorizing is not warranted in saying that the structures reflect anything else, anything deeper, or some substance or substrate behind the structures, the patterns themselves are real. Science is, for Neruel, unreflective, flat, or uncontemplative. It is blind to its symbols, supports, and substrates. It has no need of philosophy to decipher the filter uh, and, and filter through the strange structures it reveals or manifests. Thus, thus, philosophical appropriations of science are always in the end humanistic games of normalization or bet or, or worse, domestication. Never mind that the later Laruelle kind of drops the ball on this and cheapens the argument I would like to make here. As I have said elsewhere all too often, the philosopher is someone who claims to seek a way out of philosophy, but who, when they are shown the way out, refuses to exit. This is what Laruelle calls the wall, the wall of philosophy, which encloses all philosophy into its closed relation with its principle of transcendence, and which can be continually traced along the perimeter, but never transgressed. If one did go through the wall, one would just be doing science. If one did find a way out of philosophy, one would merely be doing science. So when Deleuze tells us that philosophy exists because of real problems, and this legitimizes the philosophical enterprise, and when he laments Wittgensteinians, as does Badiou, as an anti-philosophy, and, and claims that the the object of philosophy is to try to find a way out of philosophy and a solution to these problems. Can we really trust him? But you again is our straw man philosopher. You will say the emptiness, the void is just the proper name of the multiplicity behind the one. So Aristotle was wrong. There is a reality of the void. It is, it is being, or it is, it refers to being, it sticks to it like a proper name a rigid designator, a suture, a stitch between the before and the after of the event, what is left over, the remainder of the operation of existence, and that which uh, of the past is still visible from the present. But what if there is no void? And what if it helps no one to divide things in these ways? What if we took at face value that, the only, that only the superficial structural expression of reality was the true unknown, not what lies behind the structure, but precisely what hides in plain sight, the multiplicity behind the one or the virtuality behind the actual, but the, not the multiplicity behind the one or the virtuality behind the actual, but the frictions and, accumulation, and accumulated blows of history and matter that tri that, and the, the trivially existential. 
And this, this questioning intersects contemporary fundamental physics, because what does it mean to say that being as such is not yet collapsed, not yet asymmetrically oriented, or not yet historical or causal? It is, we observe, the argumentative strategy of philosophers who defend anti-scientistic stances. Everywhere it echoes calls for reenchantment, for the reenchantment of the world. So let this be an ode to disenchantment. I'm suggesting that I'm suggesting that we should avoid at one time reifying that which comes before, that which is behind the scientific image, while also the reification of some internal process or production of reality from, the in, from some kind of interrelation or individuation. This is essentially Hegel, but also Marx and in the form of uh, material history. And in another sense, we could include Deleuze and Simon Dahl and Spinoza's philosophies in this category. We should instead uphold a methodological superficiality, reject both inner and outer ontological arguments because philosophers come in two flavors, innies and outies. The superficial methodology I'm suggesting is something like finding some kind of comfort between realism and empiricism about objective modalities. The idea that we should avoid over-determining scientific data with unexplained explainers, while at the same time avoiding letting ourselves off the hook, as it were, with the cheap cop-out of underdetermination. In a sense, what I'm advocating is a kind of, well, I'm just testing this idea out here, but disquotational realism, the idea going back to Frigga that the sentence, I smell the scent of violets has the same content as the sentence, it is true that I smell the scent of violets. To say that the statement is true adds nothing to just the bare assertion of the statement itself. In other words, to ask for truth is redundant. And this is important because if it weren't for this fact, we could not do much with logic and mathematics in the first place. It would be difficult to reason with symbols and do any form of calculation if it were not possible to take one thing for another to eliminate redundancies or amplify simple terms. The whole notion of equality in arithmetic, in fact, rests on this assumption that it is possible to say five plus zero or five times one equals or means five. In terms of category theory, truth is just the identity morphism. It is equivalent to all the other morphisms that leave the object unchanged. It is, in a sense, redundant or trivial. Truth is just the identity of the model. Thus, there may be a redundancy of the whole debate between empiricism and realism, or between epistemic structural realism and ontic structural realism. But what does this extra element of onticity bring to the whole endeavor of science? We could also look upon the new realisms of the last 15 years in the same light, the speculative realisms. What really were they after? What difference does it make if scientific theories are discoveries or inventions? What difference does it make if we add to science the extra ingredient of truth, science just, just goes on without any appeal to its own truth. As Rorty notes in the text I shared, it is as though even the Kantian supposition of the noumenon was only required to buttress the idea that the phenomenal was not real, but only appearance. But what does this add? Other than a flare of language, a tickling of some neurons in our brains, a stimulation of some cerebral gland. Science does not need to decide whether the pattern is really real or if it is just pragmatically real or instrumentally real or even just empirically adequate. On the face of it, what I'm saying about realism and empiricism is the same as what Turing was saying with the Turing test about sentience and intelligence when he devised the imitation game. The Turing test just defines the threshold for the empirically adequate way of reproducing putatively intelligent human behavior. So if what I'm suggesting about realism and empiricism, empiricism holds for science, perhaps we can say the same thing about the Turing test or about the related notion of philosophical zombies.
This is what David Chalmers is famous for continually asking, unsatisfied with the Turing test. He wants some way to distinguish between someone who is actually conscious and someone who is just acting and behaving as though they are conscious. But really, what does this demand bring to the issue? And in a way, the demand for sentience or consciousness behind the glassy eyes of a human adds nothing to the performance of sentience in exactly the same way that demanding that the patterns of science be discovered and real rather than invented or phenomenal adds nothing to the process of science. But, it's a big but, as some of you might already be noticing, hopefully, there's an interesting asymmetry between the two stances. There's, in a sense, there's a sense in which the pretension to realism in science, and therefore to reductive naturalism, even if only a methodological stance, closes the door to dogmatism and demarcates science from pseudoscience. It is a kind of resistance to sectarianism, a rejection of relativism. The termination in the last instance implies a modal decision and a fact of the matter about how the world actually is. But a similar methodological stance with, regard, with regards to the Turing test would, would actually be the Chalmers-like demand for extrinsic indexes of intrinsically experienced consciousness. And this demand seems to have the opposite effect. It is this demand that immediately opens up to all kinds of spiritual language, quantum woo, religiosity, and so forth. The demand for consciousness is like a demand for enchantment. So while on one side, it is the methodological pretension of realism, of external reality, that discourages enchantment. On the other, it is the methodological pretension of the realism of internal reality that encourages enchantment. This is a strange asymmetry that begs to be better understood. And for now, let us only remark that this may be a particularity of the kind of scientific realism I've been talking about. It is not naive realism. It is, a, it is conscious of the fact that structures and patterns will likely evolve through theory change and that they are not final or absolute. So we should distinguish between the philosopher of science who argues that the patterns science arrives at are discoveries rather than inventions, and the philosopher Tuku, our straw man, uh, Badiou, for example, who claims that what science arrives at uh, is not being as such and can never be. Both are adding something to the purest methodological superficiality, which would only require a methodological or empirical adequacy. But the two pretensions are very different. The Heideggerian or the Badiouian will say there is something that is real over and above the empirical adequacy, but that natural science is blind to it. It can only access beings, but never being. And they, of course, reserve the possibility of such knowledge for the subtlest of philosophies from the armchair, or worse, philosophy from the yoga mat, or something like that. The idea that science can only touch the outer surface of the real, but never actually see the real, that it can only make endless measurements that are always subtracted from the true object, which necessarily escapes the empirical experiment and never grasp or experience the object itself. When ontic structural realism asks us to consider the structures science entangles itself with as real, it also, just as the Heideggerian, add, is, is adding a demand on science that is perhaps uncalled for by just mere empirical adequacy itself. But importantly, this extra ingredient is not defined as necessarily inaccessible, but is defined as that which is precisely what is accessed in each instance. It implies that our references actually refer, that our rigid designators actually track real things, and that these things are just the patterns which they track, real patterns. There is nothing else behind them. 
as it were. It becomes possible to suggest that perhaps the structural realist is more centrist or superficial in the sense that I've been discussing, or balanced or nuancist. But what the constructive empiricist like Van Frazen is doing is erring on the side of underdetermination, while the he Heideggerian is erring on the side of overdetermination. The perspective offered by the real pattern is a balance between these two uncalled for and unexplained perspectives. It just says what we normally call a chair is just a chair, and there's no issue with saying that the microscopic description of the particles making up the chair uh, mean that the macroscopic chair doesn't exist. When we say chair, we're just referring to the same real pattern. We are rigidly designating the same pattern that the scientists might refer to with some mathematical equation representing the atoms and quanta of the chair. It is the same chair at all levels of description, which are just different resolutions at which the same real pattern can be resolved. Okay, so I'm coming to an end here. I'm gonna sum things up. AI and the inversion of the Turing test, uh, in, in, AI, it, it, today we're seeing this inversion of the Turing test, right? The, the test is not only a test of machine intelligence, but a test of human gullibility. But this means we have only been imitating each other in a kind of Wittgensteinian game of reflexes devoid of any semantic content to language. And from an evolutionary standpoint, this makes perfect sense. The utterances of language are sophisticated ways of procreating, basically extensions of our evolutionary propensities to mate and recombine genes to, and to put them to the test. This is where we encounter Derrida and Rorty, who puts it more bluntly than Derrida, Philosophy is just a kind of literature, a kind of artistry, a style of writing that becomes fashionable and aesthetics uh, rather than a science or a quest for truth. We also meet La Ruelle here because La Ruelle, uh, in his own work on Derrida and the philosophies of difference, realized the same thing and tried to escape the consequences philosophy, philosophy he realized, had been a, a huge lie. All along, it has always closed itself off from the real. It begins with this closure and can never escape it. We can speak of two different closures, that of philosophy's closure to literature, Derrida and Rorty, and that of its closure from science, La Virelle, onto structural realism. This brings us to the question of science. Science has no need for these extra qualifications that philosophers add to it through the, their various appropriations. Badiou is case in point, Brandon too, though I skipped over the, talk, the things I wrote about Brandon. So, but Brandon, you know, will say that he, he just, basically is just reassuring us that, say, that uh, by saying that everything makes sense, he, he, uh, he's kind of claiming that as long as you keep trusting in the game of giving and asking for reasons, like a self-fulfilling prophecy, this does not add anything to the process of science as an inquiry into what is the case. Even ontic structural realism and its distinction for, from epistemic structural realism, Worrell and Poincaré, or constructive empiricism, Van Frazen, where it claims that structures might as well be taken as real as they are true invariants across theory change, across modalities and so forth, even this, is a metaphysical addition to science, which goes on quite well without this extra addition. However, the pretension to the onticity of pattern does have the benefit that it begins to shut up some kinds of mystifying tendencies associated with leaving the door open to other ideas, as does constructive empiricism, the idea of underdetermination, as in Quine. Yet the idea that our best theories may just be mistaken leaves the door open to all kinds of spiritual and pseudoscientific thought that has zero traction on anything. That's important because I'm not just bashing spiritual thought here. Is it, is it, these kinds of skeptical arguments and evil demons in philosophy are incapable of making any predictions. 
they just piggyback on the best scientific theories. Um, all they can do is act negatively. They can, they can apply doubt, but never make any positive assertions. They're not themselves theories. So methodologically speaking, we're, we're better off considering the, the structures and patterns resolved by science real. They are realer than anything else, even if flawed and provisional. If we can use the word real at all, if the word real refers to anything, if it makes any sense, it most like, the most likely candidate for the, the use of the word are these patterns that resist change through theories, those patterns which cause a friction with our exper experimental apparatus and with our senses in the first place. I am saying that as AI invites us to abandon the soul without a fight, for what would it mean to resist the machine at this point, who would be doing the resisting anyway, uh, this moment invites us to adopt a methodological superficiality. We should avoid demanding extra being of structures. We should stop asking, but, uh, but what are these structures made of? We should, um, should stop asking, uh, what are the objects that have these relations? No, there are no, there are only relations, very specific relations that are and others that are not, or at least not as fundamentally so. This is all a consequence, I think, of what I call, after Stiegler, the ultimate proletarianization. There's no way to deproletarianize this. We are we are beyond any measure of what it would mean to transcend such a requirement. It is not that we need to get our soul back from the machine, but rather the machine has shown us that there wasn't one in the first place. So it is really the final, the final Copernican displacement. For what would it even mean to be displaced further than this? There is no specific perspective. This is what science has been telling us for a hundred years, and we failed to listen. We failed to hear it. The deproletarianization comes from the future. We plug our ears to avoid the song of the sirens, a song of disenchantment. We cover our eyes to avoid the gaze of the gorgon and being transformed into lifeless stone. If there is any silver lining in this, it is that there is an ethics to this because it shows us that the closure of philosophy, this inability to open onto the perceived disenchantment of science is also the root of evil. Let us repeat it again. Constructive empiricism leaves the door open to the sect, to the dogmatic and closed form of knowledge. It is why there is no non-philosophy but science itself. But furthermore, there is no anti-fascism, no anti-racism and anti-sexism. There is no avoidance of bigotry that is not itself aligned with this acceptance of the disenchanting pattern resolved by science as a materialist dialectic, a naturalist dialectic, a physicalist dialectic, or modally realist dialectic. That is, in other words, an openness to determination in the last instance. And science is precisely the democracy and equality of matter and ideas. It is the only horizontal anti-hierarchical metaphysics, the one that appeals not to one's own experience, but defers to what will have been to compossibility, to determination in the last instance. In other words, to, scientific, to the scientific institution's fragile deferral to independent verification. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Alexander. Um, very deep as you give us many, many, many uh, notions. You bring here um, many political, biological, I must say, to, um, states of epistemology nowadays, of our understanding in this, or as you say in your own words, more far away from Politicization, that statement by Bernard Stiegler. Uh, I don't know if someone here has uh, questions, or I, I can start with a question for Alexander. Uh, 
I don't know if it's like, well, I have a question for you, Alexander. Um, many, really, because uh, it takes many notes while you are reading. Um, Remind me um, this interview to Heidegger, no? When when he said uh, the end, cybernetics is the end of philosophy, taking the point that you mentioned about uh, philosophy. What is philosophy nowadays? And, and the other aspects remind me a uh, text from Bernard Stiegel when he says we need a new theoretical computation nowadays to with this entropy that we are living now. In this aspect, my question for you is Alexander. How do you think we need to understand science nowadays in the aspects of informational entropy that we live in? Um, of course, thinking in how we take in this milieu, this new milieu that is an ambient milieu uh, of technological thinking um, in our own entanglement, in our entanglement, in this aspects of entanglement with a new, theory of computation, new theory of science, new theory of philosophies, um, yeah, because taking Stigler's statements of decentralization nowadays and, and, be, and go more far away of with how we think humanity nowadays, uh, and, and you are really, really clear to, today to listen to you. Uh, how, how do you see this, 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 this world uh, for, for us uh, in, in, in this, in this um, in these aspects of livings, livings in, 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 in these uh, new ecologies that we are, uh, that we are uh, being, that we are being in the sense of Heideggerian aspects too, no? in the sense of this uh, new being with something that is a, a, a milieu constitution, technological and biological in the same time. In this recursivity and contingency, you know, taking that quick, Statement two, we need a new cybernetics for the 21st century. No, uh, how do you see that, uh, that ideas, in, uh, how we, we can plantate it with us in, for, for this new constitution as a society and an epistemic in a no diversity aspect, aspects too, no? with this no, no, no diversity and techno diversity in tandem. I mean that's a great question, but I, you know the and that's it's a huge question, and uh, and in a way I think what I'm trying to do is answers, you know, through this in this this long winded way, trying to come up with an answer to that. Um, uh, because it does seem that we've you know that there's a huge shift of terrain happening, and. In a way, uh, I'm trying to read. Uh, well, there's a kind of uh, when I'm trying to su suggest this kind of ethics in this is trying to shift the terrain from this idea that we need to this negentropic ethics that Bernard Stiegler was developing. Um, I'm not sure that what, what I want to say really is that this disenchantment, this kind of the, the, the this, un, this discomfort that we feel by being displaced, by being dispossessed, um in this way there's a kind of ecology in that i've, I've been thinking about I, I i've been calling it tentatively promethean ecology you know this is this idea that um prometheanism is not just this idea that you go out and you just destroy nature and use it to your advantage. It's, it's, um, it's learning from your mistakes and learning to and um, learning to progressively be less stupid, you know, 
to avoid stupidity. And therefore, in so doing, almost, you know, kind of automatically, as part of the same process, you, there's an ethics in that because you, you have to take into consideration other perspectives. You have to look beyond your own narrow perspective. So that's kind of what I'm talking about when I provocatively uh, talk about disenchantment in this way and ab about the Turing test in this way and kind of this, this, uh, this ultimate proletarianization in this way. Because uh, I think the one thing that comes up, you know, in readers of Wilfred Sellers, I don't know if you've encountered this, this idea that there are right-wing and left-wing Solarisians, and the right-wing ones are, the left-wing ones are the ones that, that, um, that indulge in uh, Wilfred Sellers' uh, idea of normativity, like Brandom, uh, and and then there's on the other side there's this other aspect of Sellers, which is uh, his his he's uh, he's scientific and as, um, kind of his his preference for the scientific image and the and naturalism and and then there's so these quote unquote right wing. Uh, Salarsians like uh, Paul Churchland, Patricia Churchland, who just take who become like eliminated materialists and just and just insist that there's only you know there there are no beliefs there are only beliefs don't exist o only material things that can be measured with science exist and I don't know who came up with this division between the right wing and left wing, so, but it's it stuck. It's like everyone refers to this and knows what it is. But I think it's the opposite. Like the right wing, the, I mean, the the um, the side that is naturalistic should be the left wing, you know? So that's the kind of shift that I'm doing as well when, when I'm talking about this Promethean ecology. It, the, 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 uh, Pretension to naturalism and the the scientism, you know, the the kind of um, the um, the importance of science and the scientific image is actually what is the progressive perspective, not the right wing perspective, not the conservative perspective, but actually the pro the progressive perspective. That's kind of what I want to say. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> very important because Stigler understand that is, as the process of the know-how, no? the process of how we know, in which aspects, how we know with the tools that science use that give us to us for understanding the phenomenon of the world that we are living you know? and with these tools and, and with some process that is always um, it's not continuum process. It's always a process that is always this creative process to understand these scientists aspects of how the phenomenal, the phenomenal science we understand and we we got it. Uh, we bring us to us as an, a form of knowledge um, that I don't know if I take in that process as an aspect of as you mentioned uh, industrialization of science to industrialization of knowledge, neutralization of epistemological ways of thinking in, in this lineality that is a lineality that you're taking maybe as a tool in taking the lineality for giving a result in computation as you know, it's, there is one result that is only you need to go to certain steps to go to some results no? uh, and there is nothing else like this step from one point to another and give us this result for that. You know, um, I, I, I remind I remind now that just listening to to you, I, I remind you you have a a, a a very nice text about that, and you, you, I, I don't remember the, the the title of this desperate acts and compromises. I think 
when you're talking a little about it, you know, how, how yeah. this kind of proletarization, technological aspect of thinking, you know, uh, reminding now yeah. when, when I listen to these moments. Martin, have a question. Yes, Martin, please. Need to turn on your microphone, Martin. Great talk, Alexander. Really terrific. Uh, I, I want to turn this upside down in a perhaps a new way. Can you hear me? Okay. Yep. So I want to think about this in in what Isabel Stengers calls a cosmopolitical way. And that is the will to abstraction and the will toward the dematerialization of intelligence are two aspects of a theological position rooted in Greco-Christian hatred of the body. And it's been my instinctive response to all these arguments about AI and fears of the future that this has become a self-fulfilling prophecy generated by this hatred. And I'm wondering whether that is significant to you or besides the point or whether that forces a contemplation of the entire project of abstraction and dematerialization from an ethical perspective of seeing it as inevitably catastrophic. Um, with the idea that maybe there are other onto theologies that might be at work. And wondering whether this raises any concerns for you. So you see what I'm doing? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think that's these are good points and I have to address them. Um, early on. <laughs> um, but the uh, for me, you know, the question of the body doesn't really, um, like what is a body other than, you know, a bunch of, if you look very closely at a body, you know, it's just a bunch of organic machines or whatever, you know, yeah. that are coding and decoding their environments. If I, if I could just interrupt for a second. Yeah. I think um, I, I just plowed through a really interesting book, which is a dialogue between um, Graham Harmon and Manuel DeLanda. And I kind of seeing that dialogue 
as an interesting yeah. frame. Yeah. For the question that I'm raising. There's a, actually, I wanted to, I didn't know whether I should address that, but it's true that, you know, you, we, we could go into that. Um, they, because what I'm talking about, when I say, when I say things like we should avoid undermining and overmining, I, I didn't say overmining, I, but this is the kind of thing that Graham Harmon would say. I said uh, overdetermination. Oh. And that, under that's, determination. Yeah, that's but, exactly yeah. why I brought that's um, yeah. in, um, that's one of the reasons why I brought uh, yeah. this other way to frame what what mm -hmm. it is that I'm getting at. Yeah, you know, I mean, the, yeah, you know, the difference between process and an object. Sure. And and the fact that they come to a really interesting way to frame the distinction between those two. Well, I would say though that. Uh, the problem with Harmon is that it's, you know, once again, kind of like I would say, it's once again this 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 philosophical trick, saying um, even though he's saying like it's not out, it's not you know, it's not the object is not something else, it's not you know, it's not this, it's not the, some universal, it's not something underneath or something. It's just the object itself. We should treat it at face value. But um, but he's you know he, science doesn't need him to say that you know <laughs> it's already doing that. Um, and so uh, like his own kind of interpretation of it with his like Heideggerian you know this complex way of uh, apply, you know applying that like all objects have these characteristics and they have this way of relating to the outside and they have their own like closed aspect and all these things are just it, there's no reason to think in like scientific the man the scientific this would be on the manifest image side you know the scientific image doesn't need this doesn't necessarily need to posit that Things are in individuating or have their own interiority or whatnot. You know, they, there's um, and so this. Let's say, I would say he's erring on the side of underdetermination. You know, saying like that uh, is the kind of thing that someone would say. Ah, well, you know. It's, it's easy to say, it's easy to find ways that science could be wrong, you know, that science, like science, you could explain everything in another way, and it would still be empirically adequate, you know, you could have another explanation that's parallel to what science gives, and it would give like an evil demon, you know, like, or like we're all living in a simulation, or you're just a brain in a vat or something, right. this kind of thing, you could explain the whole world that way. Right. But it doesn't matter because because you how could you predict anything? If you did predict anything, you would have to say, well, you know, well, what I predict is that, like for example, uh, uh, James Ladyman has an example of this. It's good. Uh, says like if you have a, if you ask someone who's a, who defends the theory of the evil demon, what the weather will be like next week, he if he'll say, well. I predict that the you know the, the evil demon will make it such that the weather will be just like what the weatherman is reporting that it will be like, you know, because you can't make a prediction. There is no, you know, there's no basis in th those. There's no traction in reality. It's just this kind of thing that we. This kind of. It's so easy for for to philosophize and to make make up these these ideas that are somehow, you know, comforting or something. There's something about them that, that uh, makes us feel good or, but. Um, hey, have you read um, um, uh, Delanda's um, materialist phenomenology? 
I read a lot of the land of back in the day, but I, I can't remember. Uh, this is a new, this is a, a, new, one, no. new, a no, new book. No. It's, it's really well done. And that's the context for that dialogue. And, and I was really struck yeah. by one, how, um, congenial and empathic they were toward each other even though there are really profound differences and so i was struck by by how useful the book was but that yeah i think graham Harmon has always been a big fan of the land I mean, it, it's yeah really always been but yeah. they're they're really fundamental differences and and how delanda comes out of deleuze makes me more sympathetic to him rather than uh Harmon, although I'm been trying to come to terms with um uh object oriented ontology myself because it is alien to the thing I would say about Delanda is you know like there's this kind of there's this kind of sectarian uh you know kind of you have to take sides between the static and the processual somehow. And he's just staking that ground. He's just saying like, no, process is good. You know, static is is bad. Yeah, and yeah. I mean, that's so exactly then, it. This, that's exactly <laughs> the opposition yeah. that I'm I'm suggesting yeah. here. Uh and 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 what makes it interesting for me, particularly given the way that Graham and uh, Graham Harmon points to the value of the concept of emergence really it's really more lip service actually than any real um but which you know um delanda and myself are really invested in it suggests that that the processional is really not about humanism but about life Hmm. and 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 i think it's really important to make that distinction here and and so i mean i i guess i was pointing to this development of abstraction on the one hand and the dematerialization of intelligence and labor on the other is really a kind of death drive that that uh, that should be looked at from a cosmopolitical perspective to use stenger's term and now i'm entering into you know ethics and and you may not want to go there i i just wanted to express you know how tightly argued your 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 essay was and just wanted to shift the perspective orthogonally a little bit to see how you would respond to that and um so I mean, let me get there because there are going to be other questions from other people and uh, let me let me stop there and as thesis and perceptronium i did go quite a bit into that in that direction you know this kind of debate between process based ontology and this kind of mechanistic idea or the organ organismic and the mechanistic and try to show that really you know at the end of the, the book i'm trying to show that there's really we don't have to choose between these two sides and and really it doesn't make much sense to be um kind of steadfastly kind of defending that no you know at the bottom of things it can't be that things are just machines or that thing or or on the other side also that things are just intensity and or just uh or just some kind of uh non-object like or, or indiscreet um continuous intensity or something it it's these it's these are things this is like these are undecidable this is undecidable. I show this one example I show about why that is in the book about um, information theory that kind of shows that there's a really good argument in information theory about that, uh, that you can simulate 
you know, uh, you can simulate a continuous world digitally, and you can simulate an analog world. You know, you can you can simulate an analog world digitally, and you can simulate a discrete world uh, continuously. You know, through analog means, which means it's you know it, it's it's undecidable whether you know it's up to science to figure it out. But as, as soon as uh, Science seems to be saying that it's more on the discrete side and, and the time doesn't exist and <laughs> whatnot. Oh, hey, yeah. uh, uh, just a quick comment. I, I would really like to see what you think of uh, materialist phenomenology by, uh, by uh, Delanda. I, uh, and I'll just leave it at that and, and I'll mute myself. I'll take a look at it. Um, I want to ask you after I, uh, sorry, be before I can make another question by myself, if somebody, Daniel, you want to make your question in voice or are reading your question in the chat? Uh, I was trying to decipher it, but I was reading at the same time. I guess it's the same. Yeah, maybe, maybe if we can read in the, the text is in the chat too. I suppose it's the same. That the same. The impulse for pursuing a realist position that challenges methodological superficiality arises from the fear that the real will come back for revenge whenever it is, it is ill apprehended. That is to say, we aspire to the apprehension of truth and not only empirical adequacy so that we can feel safe from the comebacks of reality. Hmm. That enables what Andrew Feinberg calls rational critique of rationality. The idea that reason is to be critiqued whenever it contents, whenever the contents it tries to frame exceed the frame and show their inadequacy. Um, okay, the three texts, yeah. And yeah, so the three texts I was, uh, yeah, I, I, maybe I should have shared other texts, but uh, I was kind of, um, the the Van Frossen text kind of shows, it, it is, it's a, actually all three texts were saying similar things, right? They were saying um, that, um, well, one, one of them was about, the Van Frossen was about, well, the, the, uh, the Rorty text was about philosophy just being a genre of literature, you know, uh, and Derrida having said this basically, and he's, he's agreeing, he's saying that um, it's kind of the end of philosophy in a way saying that philosophy doesn't really, doesn't really reason so much as it's just a kind of a style of writing that, you know, is pleasant to a certain ear that w that developed. Um, um, and, and he's a, you know, because he's, he's a nominalist and he's a Wittgensteinian, you know, saying that, you know, the, the only, the only, uh, what things mean is just how we, what, what words mean is just how we use them and to have a concept, a concept is just, you know, the, the use of a word and he's a, pra he's a pragmatist at, at the same time. So saying that there's no added thing that semantics is, you know, that we need to kind of figure out. It's not this, 
this other realm or something that philosophy is allowing us to access. And um, and La Ruelle, which I treated a lot in in here, is, so we say very much that uh, philosophy has been kind of applying this procedure that is always, you know, each philosopher has its own his own kind of uh, transcendental procedure, but it's basically they're all equivalent to each other. They're breaking up the 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 sphere, uh, you know, the one of the real in different ways, and saying, ah, we don't have access to this, so now we need to do, you know, breaking it up so that we then have to put it back together, you know, uh, in different ways. And they, each philosopher breaks it up in a different way, and then the whole then drags drags us into this long. Uh, exposition and finally you know comes to a resolution it says that's what it is you know um and so that's within philosophy these are critiques of philosophy uh but uh i think in in the van frassen text he's saying something similar about about science and about our how we how we think about science he's saying um that we need not add this extra criterion of truth to science. So, it, you know, science is just the practice that needs to be empirically adequate. Um, it, uh, so he says like even truth, even, even the pragmatic um, theory of truth, that truth is, you know, is whatever practically works, the cash value of the proposition. Um, even that is too much, you know, we're adding too much um, burden on science. It doesn't need to be true. We don't need to think of it as true. But what I, what I kept, what I said, you know, Van Frosten is an adult convert to Roman Catholicism. And I don't think that would be possible if he didn't, if he was a realist about science, you know, if he was a realist about, about, about the you know the about scientific structures, it would be very difficult to then say, oh, well, you know, I I believe in this. I believe I have this religious belief. So that's why I was saying, kind of, he's. I think he's right, but I think there's something to be said about this kind of uh, closure of the door to enchantment, like this kind of this. Uh, the, it, it's. Um, So anyway, I was I was trying to define where exactly is the superficial point? Is it between constructive, like some like in the middle between constructive empiricism and um, let's say, uh, or between in instrumentalism and realism, or is it like actually kind of? A bit further, like between, like is it is actually structural realism the 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 center point? You know, the actual su uh, surface. It's these are yeah, these are just like very subtle ideas that I'm only coming to now and just experimenting with. But um, so I'm not sure. Alexander, but, yeah. yeah, Alexander, I was thinking now that you you mentioned this this middle point between the dialogue of science and philosophy. Thinking now in the in the field of arts, because here we are mostly uh, we are here now attending this. We are artists. Um, in this dialogue between the, the, these uh, uh, aspects of uh, epistemological science and the epistemology, epistemology of, of philosophy and, and the epistemology of process in the arts, uh, for who, for example, there is not a dialogue between science and arts and, sci and arts and philosophy. If we don't understand what that mean, the aspects of arts in the techne aspect, you know, in these aspects of dialogue between science and technology and science and, and arts and philosophy, uh, in the in the aspect of the faculties and the aspect of the function of the noetic, you know, that is uh, an, an Stiglerian worries in his last statement too, you know, the, the noetic aspect of sterilization. How we sterilization? We are we taking sterilization in the interior and the exterior. 
if they ask to go technically, how we understand this interior and exterior technically and technological, no? How, how will you, you, you see that this dialogue between the, the artistic process, the practice, the poiesis, the technological tools, no? the, the, the processes that, of desire that we have to in the sense of in this uh, industrialization points, but the arts in this in, in this middle of, of, of negotiation between both, both and, and this transgressor in this technological that you that you now pointing this in, in this table the discussion of how how we can be more crit critical, but in the arts with science and philosophy at the same time, no art arts in, in the middle of this criticizing. This is my question for you and. I want to read something from Cosmas too, for, for finishing that, that, and she say, making and learning from mistakes concerned Prometheus, right? So we need both brothers to work together. Something that the writing in the beginning. We need both, what? So we need both brothers to work together, ah, right. <laughs> the mistakes and Prometheus aspects. Right? So we need mistakes at the same time. I understand that we need mistakes for, of course, for, for going through and, and at the same time, we need these this aspects of negotiation yeah. that, um, that yeah. is in arts in some aspects too, no? the, the process of error and the process of going beyond of that. Yeah, I should have come better prepared uh, to say something about art. Um, I've just been focusing on science so much recently. Um, Hmm. I mean, I would have to, I think I still, I still uh, stand by what I said in the thesis and perceptronium about art and techne, you know, it's the, the important link between aesthesis and art and techne. Yes. That art is a kind of, um, It's a kind of techne, but a very specific kind, a very kind, a very, a very specific um, articulation, balancing of potentials and yes, exactly. like a like a house of cards or something, like a kind of it's, it's creating these symmetries and constructing these symmetries, and therefore very much um, articulated on material constraints that exist out there. And so in, in a sense, very much uh, yeah, so uh, so the question is, how do the two come together? How do the how does techne and art come together? Is that the idea? or how do how should they? Because I think they're already very much together. And I think art is just one kind of um, kind of one aspect of it somehow, like one um, uh, kind of a limit case of techne. If you could look at techne as a as a kind of a field of you know the uh, relations to the world. Um, Techne is a kind of very slow, almost like a crystal in that field. I mean, art is a is a crystal in that field. Um, in terms of a teleological or political way of thinking about it, I don't know. I'm not sure. Well, one question to that uh, yeah. that you mentioned crystallization for me is the concretization no? in some Mondonian aspects at least at least but it's not important to understand arts as a meta a meta stability yes yes exactly it's more, yeah. it's more interesting this meta stabilization of arts articulating all these alagmatic aspects of knowledge you know these no diversities and this that, that concretization in this totally, yeah. because the role of mediation at least for me, the role of mediation is very important in how we know nowadays, no? Uh, and you say science is mediations, uh, language is a mediation, operational aspects of mediation, always. But re reappropriation that arts have, the appropriation of this mediation and transforming this mediation in something different, is this, this how making 
300 degrees and other uh, stuff in this mediation, you know, in this entanglement of our science, I don't know, that opening this another window of metastability in this concretization that the scientists always putting in the books or in the, in the text, no? in their text no? giving another meanings to one meaning, no? This aspect. Uh, yeah. No? Yeah, definitely. I think in yeah, case, I think so. Case, the metastability is important in your text too, in your book too, you, you put in Useful. this. Yeah, uh, that's, 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 the metastability could be seen as that, like a kind of techniques, um, let's say goal oriented and teleological and then uh, you know it's a kind of application of purposes material application of uh, ends and means um, and so is art but kind of you know the what I come up with is a way of differentiating art in a kind of ahistorical and asocial way as a kind of just purely material, materialist perspective on art is that it's just the same thing. However, it's those places where the, um, those tendencies balance each other out and neutralize each other. Um, and so that the, they almost come to a halt which can be, it's just neither good nor bad, you know, it's, it's not necessarily a political thing to make more art or to make, you know, it's not, it could be both, it's, art could be the wrong thing to do at certain times and art could be, you know, it's not the, it's not this, there's no political takeaway from that really. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes, yes. It's, it's, it's... But that for me, the, 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 the causality on this, at least for me, is, is how, for example, Martin uh, working too much in the aspect of improvisations. You know, Ma Martin always, uh, yeah. think as always the aspect of compromising music, compromising musicians, the jazz especially. But I was thinking too in how the chat GPT or the algorithms now have the capacity of improvisation too. You know? mm. But relation and improvisation, that is different different aspects of improvising, but at the same time, they improvise in this relational uh, uh, cyclical aspects of these uh, learnings that they have. But how do you see this, this differentiation of improvised, relational and causal improvised in, in, in between the, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the field of arts again, then, given to the field of arts in, in this aspect, of how we can improvise it uh, in a different way that the algorithms doing nowadays uh, with more faster and with more viabilities, <laughs> for example, know that uh, this uh, thinking in this in this uh, words that Kangi Lane say that doesn't exist machine monsters in that time, you know, that he writing machine and organisms. But nowadays we can don't say that, you no, know, there is no monster machine, but what, how monstrosities you know, are they thinking that, you no, know, in this in these capacities, you no? Know? Maybe Taking this monstrosity in other sense, no, in only the monstrosity of, of, of given results, more monstrosity in, in, in the in the contrary aspect of the no the no the, the anti-rational aspects, maybe, no, no, the 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 the, 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 the give us in the arts maybe needs more improvisation in, in the aspects of the no representation, maybe. I don't know. It's a discussion that I bring while you discuss with Martin too, because it reminds me something about uh, Francisco Varela in, in Active Beams, maybe, you know, and this another agency, uh, agency of, of understanding capacity of knowing with no representations. Or, 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 or like you mentioned something of that in your book, you know, in, in yeah, yeah. Antonio too, you mentioned some parts about the uh, Active Beams. Yes, yes. I mean, how important how important for you that aspect, for example, in, in, in science or or in in I don't know in, in literature or, or, or understanding in the field of arts in this technical aspect, no? In active beings, yeah. no representation. How you articulate that? Yeah, I think uh, Varela was a kind of um, and Maturana, kind of a very um, cybernetic take on biology. Really, that's what it is. And uh, the, and what that says about phenomenology, or what that says about the you know the experience of that there is you know like he's uh, Varela is also a Buddhist, 
he knows that there is no self. This, you know, the ego tunnel, you know, he's already kind of on board with that, like the, the Metzinger idea of the dark phenomenology. There's not much you can say. It's just kind of, um, so I don't know. Yeah, he was also, he was also a proponent of meditation and whatnot, awareness meditation. So I don't know if, you, but still this, the, from my take on it anyway, is that the idea is that um, uh, this non-representational, you know, the idea that the representations are always um, kind of replaced by other ones, just kind of quickly kind of, um, that our thoughts are not our own, you know, that they just go, they just, they're just part of the process and that they, they think us or that the language thinks us or that the, the, the machinic process of, living as thermodynamic beings in an environment uh, simulates our thought process. That's, that's what I get from them. Um, and it's, those are very valuable. I think, I, you know, I think, I think Heidegger may, may have been right that, uh, you know, in a way, cybernetics was the end of philosophy and good, you know, good. It was, it, yeah, you know, yes. cy cybernetics came, they were still kind of coming to terms with it. But um, that's what it was basically, that's basically, the cybernetic perspective is still the one that's kind of um, now being slowly appropriated by people. Now that, you know, because you said, you mentioned this mich uh, the Kagilem and uh, I'm not sure exactly what the formulation is, but the uh, monster in the machine. Or oh, yeah, nothing exists. Monster machine. He say in the in the case, machine and organ. Yeah, like so time, in the mechanical aspects. Yeah, it just made me think of how quickly. I don't know if this is everyone's experience. I don't have a statistic. I don't have a, a good pulse of what's going on and what other people think. But. Seems to me that just like earlier this year, everyone was just fascinated by all these um, uh, artificial intelligence art. There was just, you know, just uh, monstrosities and incredibly complex visual scapes and that you don't know what you're looking at and this, these kinds of monstrous things that we couldn't even imagine. And how quickly, and this is kind of what I was noting in, in, in reference to sellers, how quickly we, bec we, we become accustomed to that and it just becomes, oh yeah, that's an AI. This was one of those AI edges. It's no longer monstrous. It becomes very quickly just normal and domestic. We just domesticate it, adopt it as Bernard Stiegler would say. And this kind of growing irony about reality that that sets in and about authorship and these are all things that have been we've been talking about for 100 years but have are just now i think with ai becoming so tangible to people who are like who don't usually think about it you know who just pe just everyone is becoming um is realizing this and it's becoming very kind of tangible so that's why I say, you know, there has to be, hopefully, <laughs> silver lining in this that we can kind of use this moment and kind of, I'm hoping, get over some of these, some of these resistances that we've had. I think a lot of, like, the, I, I think a lot of these, these traditional ways of looking at things, this way, this, this holding on to this, uh, pretension of consciousness and this one thing that can't be unmasked by science, this like little, you know, this voice inside my head that you, you'll never know, you know, my perspective. Science can never disenchant this or mechanize this or something. This thing that we hold on to that is now kind of being, you know, that is now being radically challenged is perhaps what is holding back a lot of things of uh, our, our capacity to accept, you know, the structures of science and, you know, cybernetics, for example, and um, 
and perhaps also um, a kind of radical new kind of ethics and ecology where where you you know that you're you're not at the center of it anymore. You know, you're not no longer the hero of the story, this Copernican displacement. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thinking on this monstrosity, I, I remind the project from Pasquinelli, the no scope, not to Yolanda, that they have the, the showing how it's a, the process of the learning of machine learnings and all, all the stage that they have for that. Uh, I want to ask Sefid, Sefid uh, I don't know how we are in time. We're uh, already in two hours. The feed. To push it if there are no questions coming. Um, but of course, I'm also available. We can continue. But please do ask questions. Anything really doesn't matter. Yeah, I, I, I was uh, I sitting. I was thinking. I, I want to. I want to share one one text that is for me. Uh, very in, in, interesting that is uh, about uh, Alan Turing writing about intuition and machine and human machine computation. And, and I want to ask you, Alexander, in, in your own sense, what do you think about indeterministic, for example, the indeterministic aspects and deterministic behaviors in, I don't know, in computation or in how we can yeah. have a balance between deterministic and deterministic aspects in, as a social behaviors to uh, as an individuals, you no, know, in this stacks of process uh, uh, that we are immersed nowadays in, in this process of this operational process with the role of mediation. Uh, how do you see the the the, the value on being in deterministic uh, in, in the aspects of how we see or you no know, in no diversity aspects of the atmosphere yeah. aspect. Mm. Well I think indeterminism, I mean it's um it's one of those things again that's it's it's comforting to a certain kind of to a certain part of our brain i guess uh, to to kind of think uh, that things aren't decided once and for all and that uh, that it has to do also with believing that we're in control of our own minds and in control of our own actions and decide for ourselves and whatnot. Um, but, uh, and so all these philosophies like Whitehead and, you know, that, that, you know, time is not decided once and for all, it's kind of like it's still happening and there's no, there's no, um, this, it's indeterminate. Um, and I mean, I think that's really, uh, science seems to show us that that's an epistemological um, aspect. You know, the fact that, you know, like, for example, the, the uh, like deterministic chaos, for example, that we don't, you know, we don't know how a system will evolve because we don't know all of the microstates of the system. You know, we don't know the, the where the state where the system begins and where all of the thing you know where all of the the forces are. And so, if we just jump in at any point and we kind of say, okay, this is where everything is now, and then let's then we try to predict it, and we just don't, you know, we soon. Soon chaos appears, and there's a di divergence between our our prediction, predicted model, and what actually happens. That's the weather, you know. But uh, it seems that, like you know, the science is still telling us that um, that actually, you know, the that's an that's an epistemic is because of our lack of knowledge. No, that we don't, we don't. And so, it, you know, what, what we make of that is our own business. You know, the science is saying, no, the world out there is in a certain way, in a way uh, the structure is the way it is. It, there's a modal kind of 
way that it is. You know, it's it's this way and not some other way. And and we, I mean, you can think about the block universe where like time is already written. You know, in you know once and for all, like this kind of uh, space time model where time is just a dimension of space and whatnot. But that's not. It's 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 somehow worse than that or more complicated than that. It's, um, it's that um, actually time doesn't really exist in any way. It's not, it, the, the um, and even what we usually think of as space doesn't really exist. It's not these objects moving around in space. You know, we don't, and there's actually probably no objects to speak of in reality, you know, in science is showing us these kinds of very, very weird things. And we're still thinking in terms of uh, 19th century science and thinking, oh, you know, like machines and, uh, you know, Carnot, you know, the uh, internal combustion engine and uh, thermodynamics and whatnot. We're still thinking in those terms and science is like just way beyond that has, so, it's like, this is, you know, this is an opportunity to catch up really quickly and get up to speed. Um, yeah, I think we have to update the language, update the, update the, the, science is already there, you know, philosophy is just still talking about those old things. It's, it's not, it's not even that relevant anymore. You know, we are, that's why I said, okay, the evolutionary perspective is important because it, it's part of this desubjectivizing, de-dramatizing, uh, deflationary perspective, Copernican perspective, you know. But even that is in a sense wrong because time, you know, time is not really a thing in uh, fundamentally. So what that means for us, we're like, we're, we're speaking, we're talking to each other. It, it goes very deep, you know, the, the Turing test is just the superficial level of it. Okay, we, what does it mean to say that what I'm saying doesn't even happen in time? I'm not even, you know, my, my words don't really mean anything. I don't really decide them. You know, we know this when we in this uh, this the stuff that uh, Thomas Mensinger talks about, you know, like we become conscious of what we say after we said it, you know, after a split second, after we decide something before we become conscious of it, we become before we become before it becomes possible to say, okay, this is my decision. It's already decided, and and then it, you know if you peel back the layers. Even that split second difference doesn't really exist in a temporal way out there. You know, that it's not, you know. So all of these things, I have no idea what to say about them, uh, but just that determinism and indeterminism is a kind of extremely, in it, like just, a very blunt tool for talking about what we really need to talk about. Mm. Yeah. Yes. Uh, made me made me think about um, at the same time. I well, I listen to you um, again in the field of arts. Uh, what what we can take in now as. Uh, what will become of originality now in the field of arts, a world of art, for example, having this informational uh, aspects of, of, of results with, with the algorithm that, that everything is solved at the same time, and how, as an artist, we can deal with that in the aspects of the faculties, you know, thinking in a Steglerian aspect again, the faculties that he mentioned always in this uh, process of generate something in, 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 of knowing of of 
of the how we know, no, in the sense of that these faculties of how how we can deal with that in this originality nowadays as an artist uh, with the material that we work in or any material I, I think in I don't know a sculpture painting or working with algorithms at the same time, but how we can deal with that in, nowadays in this indeterminacy that you mentioned or determinacy that we mentioned with this mediation that we are immersed all the time, no? How, how you see that uh, in, a, I don't know, in a posthuman perspective maybe, no? Now we are here talking about the posthuman perspectives. How we can deal with this aspect of the faculties as an artist or or as in another kind of fields, not only in art, you know, as philosophers, literature, I don't know. Uh, how do you see this? Yeah, I think that's an interesting question because if you can disentangle the faculties from these, from the kind of stuff I was talking about today with in terms of philosophy, where we come to, mm -hmm. you know, where, uh, you know, kind of what Matthew is saying about the philosophies uh, tickling a certain faculty in the brain, you know, kind of, there's just each, each kind of flavor of philosophy is appealing to a certain faculty, a certain gland in our brain that is sensitive to certain, like or some kind of receptor that is sensitive to a certain kind of language or a certain kind of art or a certain kind of music. And this is kind of also what Rorty was saying, even though they're not talking about it in terms of physiology, but you know, the, we could extend it into that. Um, and kind of disentangle, dis, dislocate them and kind of use them as these um, materials, just bare materials for constructing new things that without this kind of pretension to reality or to doing something truthful or scientific or, you know, just kind of just use them um, as bare concepts and see where it goes in a kind of kind of uh, democracy of ideas and just like let them uh, collide with each other and um, so there's, there's, I think there's something to be said for that. Um, kind of, and in a way, that's what I mean by, that's what I think the, the importance of this deflationary kind of de, de dramatizing um, perspective potentially can do, kind of dis, disconnect the, um, the faculties from their they're kind of lofty, you know, supposed, you know, importance, their putative uh, access to something real or truthful. Yeah. Uh, Daniel, Daniel have another comment. Uh, I, I, I will read it. I continue to think about the parallels between your last exposition in which the reading was your paper on virtual operationality and Nikolai Harman's notion of the logical posit positing of the projection of value state of things to be realized, which enable new functions of the autonomous system which posits that project. So virtual defines its place in social ontology as the directions to where pot potential side directed and its realization is to be related to the functions to be fulfilled and inaugurated but for the autonomous system which posits it. My interpretation, however, is just a reframing of Harman for what an argument from the 60s. It's also interesting in the relation of these emerging things with haunting structural realities. From Daniel, uh, this comment. Yeah. The question would be uh, how would you relate your personality to the professional community with social Nikolai yeah. Hartman, okay, yeah. <clears throat> My interpretation, 
just a reframing of Hartman's forgotten argument from the 60s. I'm also interested. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that kind of fits in with what I was just saying, I think, right? The, uh, the, we could say the protensions are like faculties. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I, I'm not sure if I can say anything about this. Um, don't know Hartman very well at all, so. Um, yeah, yeah, it was just a comment I'm trying to that notion of virtual operationality in uh, an imaginative uh, social ecology. It's uh, on the project. Good, yeah. So have to read uh, by more, by more to, to develop. Thank you, but uh, yeah, so I'll have to look at, look at that more closely. It, it sounds like a, an interesting direction. Yeah, well, uh, I think we can finish. I, I sharing a test that I find interesting too. That maybe something that God, what you, what we talking today in your speeches is from Isabel Stenger, the ecology of practice in, in science. How how we can understand this environment and how how we can broken with this environment a little more, more contaminated environment. You no, know? how. We can create an ecology of practice contaminated. This is science or another philosophy, I don't know, and this contamination with uh, and this in, uh, in ethical entanglement, you know, contaminated between each other in this epistemology of practice. You know? So I, I, I'm sharing this text that I, that I find very interesting from Stengers. Um, and well, okay, that's uh, yeah. thank you very much, uh, Alexander. It was. Uh, at least for me, um, I think so for the others too, we're very stimulated uh, because uh, you bring us many, um, yes, you can take in the notion of contamination, you contaminate us with many ideas to, to think about these disciplines, these operational disciplines, these tools that always are immersing us and we normalize it in some aspects with, we're taking as a, as a practice nowadays in our daily days. Um, and we don't notice because it's something that is uh, in the in the sense of uh, what are these aspects is micropolitical is always immersed in our in our body in our blood in our genetics aspect you know and we don't notice how contaminated we are with these operational aspects in our daily life <laughs> and how we can have a, a window a, a little window for breathing. Uh, outside of this and um, in, in our own practices, uh, maybe, I don't know, in everything we do in music, uh, artistic aspects of philosophy, I don't know, but feel this contamination as as, as, um, as a point of upside just a, a little about this. Um, in, in this, in this um, uh, how, how can I say it? Uh, recursivity. No, how how we can understand the contingency in the recursivity and how we take in this, this contingency too, no? How we take in this contingency in a pharmacological aspect too, no? Uh, thinking as an Stiglerian aspect too, no? How, uh, and, the, and, the, and the aspect of caring too, no? Caring too, uh, pharmacological and caring, no? The, the caring understanding of the uh, Stiglerian aspect too, no? How, how we care about this, um, ways of knowing, ways of, uh, of, of individuation, this process of trans-individuation too, the noetic aspects, how we sterilize, sterilize sterilization of this noetic aspect too, with technical devices, technologically, um, well, in, 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 in ecological means, I, I want to say, you know, outside of informational operations that we are immersed every day in these networks. So thank you very much, Alexander. Um, and of course, uh, I invite you, all you guys, from the next speech uh, next weekend. So Fide is going to send us information, of course. And um, thank you again, and have a very nice weekend, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.